Today, we're remembering one of New York's bravest. Family and friends are preparing to say their final goodbyes to FDNY firefighter William Moon. Moon, a 21-year veteran of the department, was preparing for a drill when he fell 20 feet and suffered serious head injuries. The brave hero started volunteering at the Islip Fire Department at 19. He then served the Queens community for 21 years at Ladder 133 before moving to Rescue 2 in Brooklyn. CBS 2's Hannah Klieger joins us now from outside St. Patrick Roman Catholic Church in Bayshore. Hannah? William Moon's loved ones and fellow firefighters are showing up large numbers to say a final farewell to the hero firefighter who died after a training accident in Brooklyn. Right now behind me, you see that large turnout of the FDNY and Mayor Eric Adams and Fire Commissioner Laura Kavanaugh are set to deliver eulogies later today. Moon's casket left the funeral home in East Islip earlier this morning and was transported to this church in preparation for the ceremony. Moon lived on Long Island but worked in Brooklyn. He was a 21-year veteran of the FDNY, but also spent many years as a volunteer firefighter in his hometown. When he was critically injured on the job, his family decided to donate his organs to allow him to save lives, even in death. Firefighters saluted and supported his family yesterday at a wake held for him in East Islip. And today he is being remembered as one of the best in the department. He comes from a family where there were a lot of firefighters, including his father and his cousin. He leaves behind a large family, including a wife and two children. We're in Bayshore, Long Island. Hannah Klieger, CBS 2 News. The funeral is now getting underway. We take you now out to St. Patrick Roman Catholic Church.
Fish across the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words in foreign lands and shall not drown. If you walk amid the burning flames, you shall not be harmed. If you stand before the power of hell and death is at your side, know that I Blessed are your poor, for the kingdom shall be hers. Blessed are you that weep and mourn, for one day you shall laugh. And if wicked tongues insult and hate you,
Sing with all the saints in glory, sing the resurrection song. Death and sorrow is that story, to the former days belong. All around the clouds are breaking, soon the storms of time shall cease. In God's likeness we awaken, knowing everlasting peace. All oh, our glory far exceeding, all that I has yet perceived. All is hearts for ages pleading, never that full joy conceived. God has promised, Christ prepares it, there on high our welcome waits. Every humble spirit shares it, Christ has passed its hand on gates. Life eternal, have rejoices, Jesus lives who once was dead. Shout with joy, O oh, deathless voices, child of God, lift up your head. Patriarchs from distant ages, saints are longing for the hem. Prophets, sonnets, and sages, all await the glory
Let us pray. Lord our God, you are always faithful and quick to show your love and compassion. Our brother Billy is gone from our midst all too soon, and we pray that you come swiftly to the aid of his family and friends, of all those who love and cherish him, that you comfort them in their sorrow, and that through the power and the protection of the cross, we live in the hope of knowing that one day we will be joined together in the embrace of your love for all eternity. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends, I'll ask now if you would kindly be seated. We'll turn our attention to the proclamation of the scripture. And I'd like to invite Joseph Marino to come forward and proclaim our first reading. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed in the views of the foolish to be dead, and their passing away was thought an affliction, and their growing forth from us utter destruction. But they are in peace. For if before men indeed they be punished, yet is their hope full of immortality, chastise a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. In the time of their visitation, they shall shine, and shall dart about as sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with love, him in love. Because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with his elect. The word of the Lord. shall want fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose the Lord is my shepherd there is nothing I shall want if I should walk in the valley of darkness no evil would I fear. You are there with your crook and your staff. With this you give me comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. You have prepared a banquet for me. In the sight of my foes, my head you have anointed with oil, my cup is overflowing. 
and kindness shall follow me days of my life in the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever the Lord is my shepherd there is nothing I shall I'd now like to invite Joseph Vitali to come forward and proclaim our second reading. reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, we know that if our earthly dwelling, a tent, should be destroyed, we have a building from God, a dwelling not made with hands, eternal in heaven. We are always courageous, although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, yet we are courageous. And we would rather leave the body and go home to the Lord. Therefore, we aspire to please him. Whether we are at home or away, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each might receive recompense. According to what he did in the body, whether good or evil. The word of the Lord. believe in him may have eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of the disciples of Jesus were going to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Clopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, 
the things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find the body. They came and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish are you! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Christina, Colin, Brienne, and Billy's family, his parents, the extended family and friends, your honor to you and to the commissioner and to the other assembled dignitaries of the, the great city of New York, and of course to all Billy's second family to his brothers and sisters in the FDNY, to each and to all, brothers and sisters all. This gospel tells us this morning of a journey, the journey of two disciples. And they're very much doing what we heard Joseph proclaim in, in, that, second, in that second reading where we walk by faith, not always by sight. But there are times when we're feeling our way along in the dark. We don't know where our next steps will take us. We certainly don't know what lies ahead. And so really it's a gamble as we set out. We don't have the benefit of a crystal ball to be able to see what the future holds, not always. And so these two disciples set out from Jerusalem. And the scripture tells us right at the very beginning, it's the first day of the week. And in our contemporary context, we could hear that and we could think, it's Monday. So the experience of those who originally told the story was not our experience. It's not Monday. 
or rather it was told in their tradition, the Jewish tradition. And it's not any ordinary Sunday. They don't know it yet. But we have the benefit of knowing that it was Easter Sunday. And they're heading to a place called Emmaus, where they could pretty much bank on the fact not a lot of people are going to know them. They are going to recognize them. And there's a reason for that, because to remain in Jerusalem after everything that has happened, they knew that their lives were in danger because folks in Jerusalem would have associated them with Jesus, would have connected them to him. They would have been suspect. And so they do something that is really rather human. They decide to get out of town. They decide to go somewhere where folks are probably not going to know them. And as they undertake that journey, as they are walking very much by faith, the scripture tells us they fall into conversation with each other. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a transcript of the conversation. I really, we would have at least a little glimpse into what they were talking about. Emmaus. I suppose if we wanted to take liberty with that, we could very well, and I think even safely imagine, that conversation was not different from the conversation that you as a family, an extended family, and fire department family, and neighbors, and friends, and as it ripples out, the conversation wasn't all that different from the conversations that you guys have been having. Conversation that centers around somebody who's loved. And it's suddenly gone from our midst. Now that's a rather, I would hope, polished way of saying it. But even yesterday at the funeral home, when I had the opportunity to spend a few moments with you, I could pick it up in the hallway that what I'm saying here was taking place in that hallway just outside the receiving visitors. They were Billy stories. Now, I heard one or two. I would never repeat them in church. <laughs> but ask me outside on the sidewalk later and I, I will tell you. The, the Billy stories. And while we don't have a transcript of the conversation with these two disciples, I would imagine, well, the stories might be a little different. They still center around someone who's loved and somebody who's suddenly gone. And so I think that we can imagine those two people saying to each other, hey, when's the first time that you, uh, when you saw Jesus? What was it about our friend that made you leave everything below him? What was it about him that you loved? What was it about him that, on occasion, could drive you a little crazy, maybe test your patience? So I would imagine those stories were being shared on that journey to Emmaus, where they were walking by faith. They were doing what we all do in the aftermath and as we come to terms with and, and we, we deal with the grief and the sudden sorrow and the heartbreak, we reach back into the treasury of our memory, into our, into our hearts, and we pull out those stories that remind us of a person's goodness of the things about them that we cherish, the things about them that we love, the things about them that we will forever miss, the things about them that made an impact on our lives, the stories that we recall, and this was one of the stories yesterday, of how it is someone can go out of their way for somebody else and do something for another person at a particular time in their life when they need it most 
And sometimes doing that for a person you don't even know. And as they're making their way by faith on that road, they catch sight of somebody who's up ahead. They don't know who it is. The scripture tells us at first, he's a stranger to them, which can seem kind of curious to us. You've spent these years traveling alongside him from one town to another village and on. How would you not know him? But the scripture says their eyes are prevented from recognizing him. They don't know him at first. But as they draw closer to Emmaus, he falls into step with them. And they begin to share their experience, which is an important thing to do. Because in the sharing of what's in their heart, that's where their healing begins. And that's true for us. It's true for your family. It's true for Billy's colleagues and friends and neighbors. See, it's more than just, it's more than just sharing memories or telling a story. It's more than just recalling with a chuckle the things about the person that made them special. It's much more profound and deeper than that. Because in the depth, the marrow of our soul, in sharing those stories, we are remembering and honoring what was brightest and best about them and being able to hold that into eternity. And so they arrive at Emmaus. And they go in. He stays with them. He takes bread. He says the blessing. A Eucharistic moment like we will share in a few moments at this holy table. And in the breaking of the bread, then they recognize him. They know him for who he really is. And it's more than just physical recognition. It's more than just being able to say, well, I know you, and, and I recognize you, and I, I know who you are. No, it's more than that. It's much deeper than that. It's more than physical recognition. It's recognition in the heart. I know you. I know who you are. Thus, my friends, we're kind of gathered in our own Emmaus moment here this morning. For quite some time now, you've been traveling, walking by faith, through a very difficult journey, a very hard and difficult journey, and sometimes feeling your way along. It's a journey by faith. But we've reached this Emmaus moment. And what, what I'd like you to remember from our scripture this morning is that as they headed out from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they thought of their friend Jesus, the one whom they loved, they thought of him as someone who was part of their past. It was a memory. They knew what had happened. They knew the circumstances of his death. And as they left, as they left Jerusalem and headed out, they were thinking of him in the past tense. What was. Only to discover on the road that when they came to recognize him, he was more than what once was, but he was also part of what will be. Not just a person of the past, not just a person of memory, not just a person recalled by stories or in our own, in our own contemporary culture, not just remembered with photos or video. No, Billy's more than that this morning. And that's what we, we celebrate for him in this Eucharist. 
Yes. He's a person of what you shared with him here in this world. But now, he's also part of your future. There was a day long ago when he was first born and he came into your lives. And he was in your future then as you held him for the first time. Christine, there was a moment not terribly long ago when he was in your future, when he caught your eye and he captured your heart. And he was in your future then. Brianna and Colin, he was in your future, waiting for the day that you would be born into the life that he shared here with mom, waiting for that happy day that they could name you and, and bring you home. He was in your future once before, and he's in your future again. And when you come to the end of your Emmaus journey, when we arrive at the end of that walk by faith, those whom we love will no longer be persons of the past or persons of memory. They are our future. And they will welcome us to that eternal reunion that we will share with our God, a reunion that will bring us into an embrace I will never see the sorrow of another day like today. My brothers and sisters, I'll ask now if you would please stand. I would like to invite Maureen and Cheryl to come forward and to lead us in the prayer of the faithful. responses, Lord, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters who are suffering affliction, may God graciously help and comfort them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in public office, may they work to promote justice and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our deceased relatives and friends, and for all who had helped in this time of need, may they have the reward of their goodness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Billy, who was given the pledge of eternal life in baptism and was fed at the Eucharistic table, may he now be admitted to the company of the saints. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord God. God. For all those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, may they see God face to face. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord God. God. For all of us gathered here in faith, may our hope be strengthened so that we may live in the expectation of Christ's coming. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the needs spoken in the silence of our hearts, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord our God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the prayers of your sons and daughters gathered. We pray now that you bring Billy to the fullness of your peace and joy and give our hearts the firm purpose and to live in the hope of knowing that one day we will share in the joy of that reunion when we arrive at our promised place in the kingdom. For we ask these and all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 My friends, I'll ask now if you would kindly be seated as we prepare the altar to celebrate our Eucharist. And I'd like to invite Brienne and Colin to present the gifts of bread and wine that will become our communion.
Pray now, my friends, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands, the praise and glory of His name, for our God and for all His holy church. Look with favor on these offerings, O Lord, that your Son, Billy, your faithful servant, may now share in the glory of the resurrection with Jesus, your Son, whose great mystery of love unites us at this altar, and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And together let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For in Jesus, the hope of our resurrection has dawned. And when we are saddened by the certainty of dying, our hearts are consoled because of the promise of the life yet to come. And indeed, for your faithful sons and daughters, Lord, life is changed, not ended. Though the body of our earthly dwelling will turn to dust, an eternal dwelling place is made ready for us in heaven. And so in the company of the saints and angels, we sing the hymn of your glory, and without end we acclaim.
questions, I'll invite you now to either kneel or please be seated. <coughs> You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, Lord, we humbly implore you, by this same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts that we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing. He gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. <clears throat> the Mystery of Faith. When we did bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you have willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an, an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Patrick and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and John, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant, Billy, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who is united with your son in a death like his 
may also be one with him in his resurrection, when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages, and praise you without end, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. now, if you would please stand. Taught by the Lord Jesus, we confidently pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously bring your peace to our days. By the help of your mercy, may we always be free from sin and safe from all distress, as together we await that blessed hope, which is the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, and you say here now among us, I leave you peace. My peace is my gift to you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant us peace and unity in accord with your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. My friends, peace of the Lord Jesus be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us all for each other a sign of peace. Once more, if you would please kneel. Be 
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Jesus, who takes away the sins of this world. And blessed are we, who are invited now to the Supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
when pain and sorrow weigh us down, be near to us, O Lord. Forgive the weakness of our faith and bear us up within your peaceful world. I has not seen, he has not heard what God has ready for those who love him. Spirit of love, come give us a about a single breath, we flower and we fade, yet all our days are in your hands, so we return in love what love has Those who see with eyes of faith, the Lord is ever near, reflected in the faces of all the poor and lowly of the world. mystery from the past in halls where saints have trod yet ever new the music rings to Jesus living a song of God I have not seen Together now, we stand and pray. Lord our God, you nourish us by this Holy Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus, your Son. As we make our pilgrimage of faith, we walk by faith, not by sight. 
may our brother Billy, who shared in the Eucharist, come now to that life Christ has promised and prepared for him. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends, may I ask you to please be seated. At this time, it is my privilege to introduce to you His Honor, the Honorable Eric Adams, Mayor of the City of New York. Thank you, Father, and on behalf of the fire commissioner and the police commissioner and the chief of the department and the entire 8.8 .8 million people of the city, uh, I was reflecting when I looked at little Colin. I recall during the mid-60s, my family received a notification that my Uncle Joe was killed in Vietnam. And I remember the response uh, in our house. And as I looked at the innocent eyes of Colin, as I stood in front of him, he must have said to himself, who is this man? Who is this man that's disrupting this moment? As he's seeing all of these faces for the first time, the innocent eyes of a child. And there's something I think about when we were here and we attended Jesse's funeral, a firefighter we lost in February. And the three firefighters and one EMS first responder that we lost. And when we walk into the hospital, or we attend the wake, or we attend the funerals, I'm sure Commissioner Kavanaugh and Commissioner Sewell would tell you that it is such a challenging moment and part of our careers to have to go through those moments. But when we watch the faces of the parents and of the spouses, they give us the courage we need. And there's a common thread that goes through the families of our first responders, a thread of service. And if we only reflect on the physical transition to the spiritual transition of the individual we are honoring today, we really miss the common denominator of the families of service. Just watch Firefighters Moon's family. His dad, a Vietnam vet, who put his life on the line to water this tree of freedom that we all sit under today. His wife, when I think about her as an educator, inspiring young people and ensuring that they can understand their role in the lives that they will live, his mom being the anchor of the family, and ensuring that she could give the love and care that not only her son and his sister and brother, but also the grandchildren that will follow. That's the common thread that flows through what I say all the time the American family, and what we represent. That patch that shows red, white, and blue is more than just an indicator of what it is to be a member of the FDNY. It's an indicator of what it means to be an American family. We're going to miss Firefighter Moon. But he was not only a hero in life, he understood what it meant to be a firefighter, courage, bravery, and sacrifice. But he was a hero not only in life, just to think as he transitioned and donating his organs to others. He's a hero in death. And that's a real reflection of who he is as a person. It's a real challenge in these moments. We always lost for words on what we could say or what we should say. But all I can say to this family, we are here with you. We will continue to be with you. This entity and body of people never forget those men and women who have served with them. They would do it throughout the year if it's hanging a plaque in their firehouses 
or the days of remembering the fallen heroes. This is a rich culture of respect and understanding of those who have served and who have sacrificed. I cannot thank you enough for giving us your son, your husband, and Colin, your dad. Cannot thank you for what you have done. And to Patricia, to William Sr., to Wart Robert, to all of you, I thank you. Christina, I thank you. Thank you for what you have given both the commission and I. You've given us the strength. When I saw you the first day in the hospital, I saw the level of strength that said to us, it's okay. Your husband understood the sacrifice of being a firefighter. He understood the commitment and dedication that came with it. Yes, we are sorry, We're sorry that your babies are losing their dad so early. We're sorry that you're losing your spouse, but we cannot thank you enough for what their dad and what you have given us in Firefighter Moon. May God be with you, your family, the city of, this, of New York, and our country. Thank you. We'd like to introduce FDNY Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh. Firefighter William P. Moon II, or Billy, as everyone called him, exemplified the FDNY in every way. He was the type of person the FDNY attracts and the type of person the FDNY shapes. He was not a hero because he was superhuman. He was a hero because he was a man who chose to get, dedicate himself more fully to those around him every single day. Billy's story isn't ending today. It's a journey and one that continues. Billy began his long career at the FDNY more than 20 years ago, just a year after 9-11. And last week, after his accident, he gave his lungs to a retired firefighter and a 9-11 first responder, Terrence Jordan. Terrence nearly gave his life to save others on 9-11, and his response that day left him tethered to an oxygen tank. Billy's lungs have literally breathed life into Terrence Jordan made him part of Terrence's story and the story of all of those who Terrence rescued that day at the Towers. Billy's commitment to saving others is so extensive that he is fulfilling the mission of the FDNY, transcending boundaries to give back to people who served before he came on this job and inspiring those who will serve after he's gone. And that so exemplifies Billy Moon. The perseverance, humor, kindness, and optimism he put into being a husband, a father, a friend, and a firefighter. Whether at the firehouse, at home with his family, or on the soccer field with his children, Billy understood that his commitment to his community was so much larger than himself. He was an excellent firefighter that you'd want on your team, a man who was happy to pitch in and pick up the slack wherever needed who put so much of himself into public service to save others. As a young firefighter, Billy worked in a busy fire company, Ladder 133 in Jamaica, Queens, and dreamed of serving in one of the FDNY's most elite rescue companies. He worked hard, he drilled, he trained, he served his local volunteer fire department, he showed up and he lived by example. He made that dream of serving in an elite company come true when he was detailed to rescue Company 2 in Brooklyn, where he would respond to some of the most challenging emergencies the FDNY faces. When we think about the FDNY, we think about people like Billy, a man who understood that community can, can be greater than the sum of its parts, who understood you could impact others in a million different ways. Billy fundamentally understood that he was part of something larger than himself. And if something ever happened to him, 
Not one, but dozens would show up in his place to coach sports, to tell a joke or a story, to ensure that life kept going for those he loved. This is why he was so dedicated to ensuring he could give back after he was gone through organ donation, so he could bring joy to other families even as his own lost so much. In the tradition of the FDNY, Billy would not simply suggest you should become an organ donor. He would demand at the kitchen table that his coworkers pull out their driver's license and prove to him that they had the small heart under their photo that indicated they'd signed up to be a donor. And if they didn't, he would insist they signed up immediately. I hope that at this moment, you will all consider whether you have that little heart on your license, whether you would answer the call if you could, it is what Billy would have expected I would ask today. There are really no words to process the grief and the gap that Billy's death leaves us with. But Billy also left us with hope and comfort in knowing that part of him was on in his family, in his children, and in the lives he so selflessly saved throughout his life and even after his death. He is the best of us all. And we are not only better for having known him, but we are stronger in this moment because he has equipped us to live by his example. In losing him, no matter how hard it is, Billy is still teaching us how to show up for others. We all have that step we don't want to take or that conversation we don't want to have. Billy always chose to take that next step, and we owe it to him to do the same for others. Billy quite literally lives on in his lungs that are allowing someone to breathe right now, in his spirit so obviously embodied in the large personalities that show through each of his children, in the strength he gave Christina to get through this moment. He lives on because he chose always to take his promise to others one step further. That is the type of person Billy was and the person we all hope to be. This department will hold the memory of firefighter Billy Moon in our hearts forever, and we will never forget him. May God bless his family, his wife, Christina, his children, Brienne and Colin, his parents, siblings, and the entire Moon family. May God bless Billy's coworkers at Rescue Company 2, Ladder Company 133, and the ISA Fire Department. And may God always continue to bless the FDNY. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Lieutenant James Keene to come forward. So others may live. Four simple words that has been a war cry for generations of firefighters and emergency medical technicians. We embrace this campaign and make it our life's mission. Billy Moon exemplified this in both life and death. Billy always had a smile, an infectious laugh, and loved to play jokes. He also had many names. He went by Billy Boy, Mooney, Moondog. But Billy was really tall, lanky, and very easily startled. So he quickly earned the name of Ichabod Crane, based on the legendary character of Sleepy Hollow. But my personal favorite was PETA. Not based on the bread, but an acronym for P-I-T-A, which stood for pain in the, and you guys can the rest, forgive me, Father. Having a conversation with Billy was never easy. He was an expert debater. He loved to argue, but in a way that made everyone laugh. He would always point out how his opinion was obviously common sense. <laughs> I always felt <clears throat> he would have made a great trial attorney, but his parents instilled values to care for others, and that led Billy, Billy to his true calling, a firefighter. After he graduated from the FDNY Academy on his very first tour, he came to Merrick Boulevard, bopping into the firehouse with his hat on backwards and earrings. He also had on his ice look fire department racing shirt, sweatpants, and sneakers that made him look like a 1980s gym coach. <laughs> I could only imagine what the senior members of uh, 133 were thinking. Look at this act. He spent 20 years in Ladder 133 and a lifetime trying to get into rescue too. As an ultra competitor, Billy worked hard to hone his firefighting skills and master his craft. 
When Billy's fire helmet had to be replaced, some members gathered around and joked about Billy's new helmet, which is only a few weeks old, kind of looked like the middle one right there, of how abused it was. And without missing a beat, Billy smiled and said, I go into windows you guys dream about. <laughs> well, that quote stuck with Billy and is referenced every time we tell Billy Moon stories. Throughout his career, he's always made a difference in people's lives. I'm not surprised he was courted by Rescue 2. Billy was one of the elites. As intense as his personality was, his work ethic was extraordinary, both in the firehouse and on the fire floor. As a leader, he led by example, and Billy would often put his arm around less experienced firefighters and remind them that they're a valuable part of the team, and he'd work with them to be they, the best they could be. His goal was to be a rescue firefighter. He submitted his application and waited years to be selected. Billy never got discouraged on the length of time it took. He believed in the process because he knew what it meant to be selected. You see, rescue firefighters must be the best. They are our version of the military special forces. And when a firefighter is in desperate need of help, the rescue companies come to save us. Everything in Billy's life prepared him to work in rescue. And when he was selected, after he attached his rescue to front piece, his smile, which was already big, got a little bit bigger and a lot better. It was confirmation for what we all already knew. Billy was the best. He was an even more incredibly dedicated husband, father, son, brother, and a friend. Christina, or as many of us would call her, Saint Christina, <laughs> we knew he was a handful. Billy wasn't just her husband, he was also her first child. <laughs> and it was obvious at Billy's wedding, when Billy's mom negotiated with the DJ to switch the mother-son song at the midway point from a slow song to hit the road jack. <laughs> Christina and Billy's love for each other was evident. When they were together, they would laugh and joke, and you couldn't help but admire the way they looked at each other. He kept a picture of you in his locker. When he would ever open his overstuffed locker, after all the clothes would spill out, there on his door was a picture of you and Brianne and Colin, reminding him of all the great things in his life. <sighs> Brianne and Colin, you made your father so proud. He would often brag about your accomplishments. He'd show us countless videos of your athletic abilities. You both have many of Billy's traits. Whether it's your competitiveness to beat each other or your quick-witted responses, it's the way you care for others that I find remarkable. Bree has participated in charitable events already, helping other children in our military, and Colin will be donating his long blonde hair to kids that are sick. In closing, the late Marvel creator, Stan Lee, he once said a hero is someone who is concerned about other people's well-being and will go out of their way to help them, even if there's no chance of reward. That person who helps others simply because it should be done and must be done, and because it's the right thing to do, is so indeed, without a doubt, a real superhero. Brianna and Colin, your dad is a real-life superhero. <laughs> All the very best qualities live within you. <laughs> you have the support of the FDNY and everyone whose lives he touched. We will miss your dad. <laughs> but we will never forget him. <laughs> and we will tell his story. For those who knew Billy, he would say he never lost a fight. He didn't lose his fight because he chose to give the gift of life. So today, I call on you all in attendance here, or watching from home, become an organ donor, tell your family, change your license. It's what Billy did and it's what he would want us to do. So others may live. I miss you, buddy. Please watch over us. We would now like to introduce Captain Liam Flaherty.
Good afternoon. I'm going to be uh, mercifully short. You're getting a two for one here. I'm going to speak first, and then James is going to give us some words from Ed Daly. People always ask about my selection process for new members. It simply starts with an interview. Guys with time on and experience, like Billy, come to the firehouse. They drop off a cake and maybe some cigars in the kitchen. Uh, I know 133, you guys are American magic, but if you guys want to see real magic, see how quick uh, free cigars disappear from Rescue 2's kitchen table. Yeah. Always when they come back down there, they're, they're all gone. Uh, so basically, we'll go upstairs and we'll have a chat, like I did with Billy. I'll tell them what's expected, and they'll tell me what they can offer. Before they leave, I give them a caveat. I will be asking around about you. The response received from multiple sources will either drive you up my list or down. If I hear good stuff, you go up. If I hear uh, the killer response on the FDNY, like, yeah, I know the guy, that drives you down. So. I kind of borrowed this from uh, Special Forces. Uh, it's called 360 Peer Review. Uh, they, uh, they use it, and uh, I've used it extensively with our place, and it almost always guarantees I'm going to be getting the best of the best. So, so Colin and Brienne, you guys would be very proud to know the responses I got about your dad. I got lines like, words and phrases, exceptional. Best guy in the firehouse. He's a beast on the fire ground. And you guys could take that. And I, I, I have other stuff I'm going to share with you. Like, you guys would be so proud of how uh, highly regarded your dad was, you know, by all of us. So when I got those kind of responses, I was very eager to get Billy over, and we got him a slot. And uh, as you know, I know you were helping him with all of uh, his uh, schooling and stuff. He went through uh, hundreds of hours of training and schooling. We were talking about that. I guess, uh, you know, Billy seemed very bright, but I, I think uh, you, you brought that out in him. <laughs> uh, during his trial, all eyes were on him, and uh, he performed exceptionally, okay? And uh, he was quickly thrust into the ultimate test uh, last April uh, as a new guy. Uh, a very serious fire down at Canarsie, where we lost one of our brightest stars, Keith Klein, from Ladder 170 in a horrific house fire. And uh, I was driving into work, and I heard, uh, you know, I heard what was going on. So I drove to the fire scene, and I, I just wanted to check on my guys, and uh, you know, just see what was going on. And uh, I, I, saw, I saw the rig, I saw all the guys, and I saw Billy sitting on the back step, and. Uh, you know, I guess thousand yards there comes to mind how, how all the guys looked were, that were at the fire. And uh, went up and talked to Billy. I said, hey, how you doing? He goes, uh, I think I'm okay, Cap. And uh, not much came out, good came out of that day. But one thing that did come out of it was that at that moment, I knew that we had our newest member of Rescue 2, that Billy had passed the test. Uh, he was a keeper. I, I looked over at all the other guys that were working. They all looked in Billy's direction, and they gave me a nod, and Billy passed the test with the fellas. Uh, I'll just end it by saying, and we'll put James on, that uh, you guys are telling me that Rescue 2 is Billy's dream. And I'll, I'll add to that, or twist it around, I, I'll say that Billy Moon was our dream. He was a dream to have on our rig, even for the short time, and he made us all better. And uh, thank you for sharing with us. And God bless you guys. Hello, my name is James Dowdell. I'll be delivering this on behalf of Billy's longtime friend, Ed Daly a former member of Ladder 133 and a current member of Rescue 2. This is uh, Billy and Eddie's story. 
Billy and I met my first tour on Ladder 133. He had already been there a couple of years when I was assigned, so he took me under his wing, so to speak. We became friends, good friends. In a short amount of time, Billy would have, Billy, Billy would have been uh, referred to as my boy. I'd be reminded of this frequently. Every time I walked in the door, someone would ask, did you hear what your boy said? Did you hear what your boy did? If you knew Billy, you knew he loved a good debate. And we all love to watch him in action. Even if you were the one he was debating, he would let you know he had the upper hand immediately. Because he possessed two things the other person he was challenging simply did not possess. Common sense and logic. Our friendship extended outside the firehouse. My friends from home became Billy's friends and vice versa. I even knew of Paul Fluge, a close friend of Billy's who lived in California, who up until last week, the guys on Merrick Boulevard thought was Billy's version of Bigfoot, <laughs> often spoke of but never really seen. Nicknames are commonplace in the firehouse and Billy had many, but one stuck. Since it's not appropriate to say out loud in this house of worship, I'll just refer to it as a feminine product made by Summer's Eve. <laughs> Naturally, he wasn't going to let me take that one alone, so he made sure I got one to match. We've greeted each other with it every time since. Our wives and even my four-year-old daughter have called us this on occasion. Billy went as far as to make a custom Halloween costume depicting me of the said product. Billy's wife, Christina, is a strong woman. We've all seen this in the last two weeks. I've witnessed her ability to remain cool, calm, and collected before. The night of my wedding, Billy, Christina, and some others stayed for a little after party. Billy and I were having a cigar, and Christina walked over to Billy and said, when you're done with that, we're leaving. It's 4 a.m. Without skipping a beat, Billy reached into his inside pocket and pulled out a fresh stogie. Holding one in each hand, he told Christina, I'm going to light this cigar with this one. While she was not amused, it was a line that Billy would have referred to as a classic. And as far as we were concerned, it was. However, I know Christina probably anticipated a rebuttal like that from Billy. They had known each other for a long time prior to dating and getting married, so she was no stranger to Billy's sense of humor or stubbornness. Billy and I shared a love for the job. We were both farming in our hometown as well. However, we had our differences when it came to his other love, the Islip Wolves, which was a well-kept secret from his new brothers in Rescue 2. I let Billy know from the very beginning to keep that part of his life out east for a while, but Billy loved the racing team. And I did not have a problem with the team or the guys from Islip, many of whom I'm friends with. I was just annoyed that we had to schedule trips, nights out, or anything else around Billy's practices and tournaments. He was 100% committed to this team. I would rag on him about it, and he would quickly hit me with, you just don't understand because you don't have an athletic bone in your body. <laughs> and this was true, so my comebacks were limited, and I'd usually settle for a loss. Billy and I had the same career goals, one of the reasons I think we became so close. We both wanted to go to a rescue company. And although there were five, in our eyes, there was only one, Rescue 2. Getting a spot in a rescue company is not easy. There is no shortage of great firefighters looking for a spot. But getting into Rescue 2 because of its reputation is even harder, and coming out of Borough seemed impossible. I interviewed with Captain Flaherty and got the call to come a year or so later, a call I attribute to the way I was mentored in Letter 133. Billy and I would often speak about how things were going, and every single time we spoke, he would say, and again, this is not an actual quote because of where we are, but the gist of it was, don't mess this up, because he thought it would affect his chances. And for this reason, when Billy got the call, I immediately let him know it was due to my performance, not his, that he was coming to the company. That statement was completely fabricated, but like stated earlier, Billy loved a good debate, and I was simply casting a line. In the time that I left Merrick Boulevard to the time Billy had gotten the call to come to rescue, Billy obtained the rank of senior man in the truck. 
While it's not an official rank recognized by the department, such as lieutenant or captain, the senior member of the company is unofficially in charge. Company offices come and go, but senior firefighters are an invaluable part of the firehouse. By all accounts, Billy had it made. He was the senior man in a great company, and it would have been an easy decision for him to stay put. Guys thought he was crazy to leave at that point in his career. But Billy, this was a no-brainer, he said, a quote he used often. When he got the call to come over, we were both excited. We were both happy that we'd be working together again. Billy was excited about all the challenges ahead, and I was excited that the tables actually turned, and Billy was now junior. Something I would refer to him often just to mess with him. Billy was definitely a black cloud in ladder 133, and that stayed with him in rescue too. In his first few tours, he operated at some very serious fires, and his performance solidified what we had known all along. Billy was great at his job. The only thing Billy loved more than being a fireman was being a father. He was very proud of his chil children. Colin and Brianne, he would speak of you often. Just recently, he was talking about how Colin scored a winning touchdown in the same day he scored two goals in soccer, or how Brianne scored two goals in her game as well. In the caption on his Facebook page, reflecting his children, he wrote, time is flying by and I'm enjoying every minute. I see Billy and his children, and it's especially evident in watching them do their own honor guard at the wake. To Christina, Brianne, Colin, and the entire Moon family, you will always have a home and rescue too, and a place in our hearts. Billy was one of a kind. He impacted everyone he met one way or another. The guys at Rescue 2 got a refined version of Billy Moon's personality as he was busy doing what new guys do. But I know that the real Billy Moon possessed all the qualities and characteristics of what we hold sacred in our kitchen. Billy, you're top five, 100%. You'll never be forgotten. I love you, buddy, and I miss you already. The job will never be the same without you. We'll see you on the other side. I would like to call forward retired FDNY Thomas Butler. This is my lifesaver. So I met Bill Moon in 1994 when he walked through the doors of the ISO Fire Department. This long, lanky guy coming in, we didn't know what we were getting, you know. Had a bit of an edge to him. Um, but the first training that we had, we're out in the parking lot. We had guys crawling through the parking lot, because it was in July that he came in, advancing a hose line. Probably the most important thing that you have to do in the fire department. Um, so a few guys went and they were going nice and slow and stretching it across the parking lot. Now Billy's turn came. He picked it up and ran. And we were like, whoa, 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 whoa. You got a backup man? No, no, backup. I don't need a backup man. I got this thing. And then we really realized that his family was in the ice of terrorist fire department. They were very involved. And we started asking around, and we found out that Billy and his brother Robbie used to in the backyard, and yes, this was racing, and we love racing out on, in Iceland. They were stretching their little, their little cart that they had their wagon with a hose in it, and somebody hit the hydrant, and then somebody else would put the, put the fire out of what was supposedly the fire, hopefully. So they were doing this as kids. When everybody else was out playing in the playground and climbing trees, <laughs> These guys were in the backyard running what we call efficiency. But um, stretching hose lines and, and putting water on a fire. That, it ended up being what Billy really loved to do. Um, I got to tell you, he was a trip. He, he was really a trip. Um, 
I had a roofing company as my, as my side job. And um, Bill was in the fire department maybe a few months, and, and I hired him to come to work. So he comes to work and very handy, good work ethic, worked hard. And in about the second week, he came over to me and said, hey, listen, we can do this faster. There's a better way to do this. I was like, just get up on the roof and put the shingles on the roof, please. No arguments here. That was not the last argument that we had on the roof. We were together roofing for many, many years. And I'm telling you, he loved to argue. He would argue about the color of the sky, whether or not the leaf hit the ground or landed on top of another one. He found something to argue about all the time. But as time was going on, I had two worlds with him. I had the work world with him and the fire department. In the fire department, he was excelling rapidly in the fire department. Um, I, did, I did the training for the ISO fire department. And Billy wanted to do everything faster. And then he'd come back the next week with how we could do it better. But that was Bill. Bill was always going to try and make it better, do it faster. <laughs> um, and if you didn't agree with him, he argued with you. And he would, he would say to me all the time, listen, you're not understanding me right now. This is the way to do it, 100%. And with that 100% thing, we heard that probably once or twice a day. Um, but that was Bill. And he would just love to argue, and he loved to get it going. And let me tell you a little story about us with our group. <laughs> this, was, this is true, Bill. So we're working one day. It's me, Billy, and a helper. And it's an easy day. We're just banging some nails. and. All of a sudden, Billy freezes. I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? I'm like, what's wrong with you? He says, uh, that's Islip Terrace's siren. I think it's for a structure fire. So we're sitting. I go, okay, good. Put the shingles on. Let's go. Put the shingles on. Nah, that wasn't good enough for Billy. He goes up to the peak of the roof. He looks over. He comes flying down the roof, throws his nail bag, throws the tools down, and he slides down the ladder. And he's running. He's going, come on. I go, where are we going? They have a job. They have a job. I was like, who's the boss here and who's the worker? So, of course, I sort of like fire a little bit myself. I slid the ladder. We got in the car. We went over to Isop Terrace. And we ended up getting, in, getting involved in their firefight. And it was pretty cool. But then I got scared a second time because we were down in the basement. I had the nozzle. And I heard this voice say, hey, who's on the nozzle over there? And it was Willie Moon. And I was like, oh, no, Willie Moon is not going to be happy that a guy from myself has a nozzle in their basement for it. So I was like, you're, you're come over here, you know, clear her. And as soon as he cleared the turn, he was like, what the, are you doing with a nozzle in my fire? I said, here you go, Willie likes it. So we got outside. I said, Bill, let's get rid of this stuff fast before your father comes out of the basement and go back to the roof. And that's what we did. We got out of there because I did not want to face that man after we were in his basement fire. And that, that's, that's, how, that's how we are. You know, we like to put out our own fires. Billy's arguing constant, constant. We're working one day, and we have these shingles that are called timber lines. They're wrapped in cardboard. So I was like, I got to shut him up for a while. I said, I'll tell you what, Bill. Please, if you can get two bundles up onto the scaffold, I was working with my brother Stephen, and God rest his soul. I'll buy lunch. Oh my God. Everybody knows Billy was getting something for free. He ran over to this bundle of shingles, put two up together, but I knew what was going to happen. He uh, puts them two together, he puts them on his shoulder, and the top bundle of shingles, they all, all the shingles slide out. So he turns around, he looks at me, didn't stop him, went to the pile of shingles, took another bundle. Put it on. What about the other ones? We'll take care of them later. I said, all right. He puts it on his shoulder, and sure than um, sure than sugar, he got them onto the scaffolding. Turned around, and said, "What's for lunch?" So I had to buy him his lunch. But it was it was worth it just to watch him struggle to do it. But that's the kind of person that he was. He would struggle to do it, but he was going to get it done. Billy didn't believe in failure. I'm going to tell you right now, Billy didn't believe in failure. No matter what it was in his life, he did not believe in failure, whether it was sports, um, no matter what it was. So let's get down to the real nitty-gritty of Billy Moon. And I know some of you aren't going to want to hear it. In 1995, Billy joined the Ice of Wolves drill team. Yes, it is racing. Yes, it is a little scary, but it surely is fun, you know. So he raced for 16 years. In the 16 years that Billy raced, we won 12 invitational tournaments and we won two state tournaments. That's the kind of guy he was. 
There were eight events in a tournament. Billy ran all eight events. Not many people did that in their careers in racing. He ran all eight events and made that team successful. But, oh, man, if you were late for practice or whatever the case may be, you, you don't want to run into Billy Moon because he would definitely take care of you. Um, he's not going to put up with any of that. So now we talk about the mentor, the mentorship of Billy. We were talking about the, the, him being a mentor before. See, I guess he had about 13 years in Iceland, and my son joined. So I, I told my son, listen, here's what you're going to do. You have no skills yet. Make sure you get by the front door with a six-foot hook, because when they get tired of pulling the ceilings, guess what? They're going to come out here, they're going to look for a guy with a six-foot hook, you get them to go to work. They go to a job. <laughs> Billy comes to the door and goes, oh, you got a hook? Come on. They go into the building. It's rarely loaded down with smoke. Tommy goes to start pulling. Billy taps him on the shoulder. He took his SCBA breathing apparatus off and put it on Tommy. And Tommy was like, I don't really need this. And Billy said, oh, no, no, no. You're wearing that because I don't want to listen to your father when he comes home and he finds out I let you go into a smoke, a smoke condition without having your scot pack on. So, but that was Bill. It was his mentoring. And then he talked to Tommy about that fire, worked on pulling ceilings, worked on opening, uh, you know, trimming windows. Billy was the consummate firefighter, I'm going to tell you right now. There's nobody that was better. I was talking to uh, one of our buddies. Um, Ex-Chief Tom Farrell. And I said to Tommy, I said, listen, uh, this, is a, this is just such a huge loss for the ISO fire department. And he put it in a different way. He said, Tom, this is generational loss. Billy was a chunk of our foundation that, that got taken away from us. Now we have to make up for that. But how do you make up for a Billy Moon? You, you can't make up for a Billy Moon. It's going to take time. It's going to take a long time. Our substation up in the north end of our town, Billy put a new life into that substation. And who's because he started off at headquarters down in the south end of town, moved up to the north, and now we wanted to beat the south into all of their runs. And we were like, man, what a traitor, you know? He's just a traitor. He just bailed on us, and now he's going to take our runs away from us. So that didn't go over too good. We, we, we really didn't like that too much. But he, he was just, he was truly that generational guy. And generational, we don't have to put dates on it. It's, it's how many guys came in at a certain time in our volunteer fire department. And when he came into that North House, we lost him. We took that big chunk out. I'm telling you, we lost, we lost a really big chunk. We lost, we lost a big part of our identity, and that's what's most important. You always will have to have your identity. And the identity of the ISO fire department is, is a guy like Billy Moon. I mean, I, I, I really can't say enough about him. I can talk about how we fought all the time, and I can talk about how we fought fires all the time. It was always, we always had that smile for each other when we were on the fire floor and we got to see each other. Um, but that was Bill. He just had that, he had that effect, you know. He just, he just got it done. That, that, that's all I can say. From. We got to watch other parts of Bill's life as he was uh, coming up in his life. and. You know, he married Christina, who is probably the strongest woman I've ever seen in my life, or ever met in my life. He had Bree and Colin, and it seemed like he sort of restarted himself. Now, it was all about Bree and Colin, their sports events. Um, they were always down at the firehouse. We loved seeing them at the firehouse. I mean, they, they're great kids. We even have our own little handshake, right, Kyle? Yeah, we'll show it to them later. We won't show it to them now. But that, that was what Billy did, you know. In 2002, when he got into the uh, New York City Fire Department, I got to tell you, when I saw that he was going to 133, I was so ecstatic for him. Um, I was a member of Ladder 133. 133 and, and Engine 275, one of the best shops on our job. And I knew Billy was going to have a great experience there, and I knew that he was going to make that company better because of his firefighting. He was a warrior on the fire floor, no lie. He's one of the best that I have ever seen. I've been doing this for 47 years. He was a warrior. The man was a warrior. He did things that a lot of people would have never gotten done. But that wasn't Bill. Bill had to finish the job. He had to get the job done. 
He just, that, that was Billy. He is, the, he is the ultimate loving father, and I believe he's the ultimate loving husband. He was a family man. Um, and that, that comes from the way he was brought up with, uh, with Patty and Willie. You know, we've known them a long time too, and they're part of our firehouse. Um, well, there's just one thing I need to straighten out here. Billy was a hero before this tragic accident. He donated 20 years of his time in a volunteer fire department and in some very dangerous situations. He trained our guys. He, w he never sat out a fire. He never sat on the couch and said, no, I'm not going to go on this one. He went on everything because an automatic alarm might be a working fire and Billy didn't want to miss a working fire. And he did have that same luck with us that he had with Rescue 2 and 133. He always seemed to make the working fires and Billy was in the job. And that's the way it was. And as, as a teammate, teammate he was phenomenal. Um, I would take 10 Billy Moons on my team any day of the week. If you do that, you have a phenomenal company and things are working really well for you. But Bill became a hero doing that. He became a hero giving 20 years of his time to the New York City Fire Department in very busy places and ultimately getting to rescue too. So that, for that he was a hero. Now, in my eyes, he's an American hero. He donated his organs to two FDNY members and they are breathing life around Christmas time because of Billy Moon. If you want to talk about unselfish, I would think that that's pretty unselfish. And I did check right away to see if my license said organ donor on it because of Bell. Um, he is, I, I don't know, he's the ultimate that you, that you need to have in your life. You need somebody to argue with. You need somebody to straighten you out. You need somebody you want to straighten out. Just makes a nice big package. In the fire service, Billy was the best thing that we had. We will miss him dearly. Colin and Brianne, you have 135 uncles in the ISO Fire Department. You ever need anything, you just make a phone call and we're going to be there for you. And we will be there for Christina also because we love Chris. We know what she went through with Bill. Tough. I think she's the one that straightened them out. Um, I just, God bless the Moon family and may God bless our American hero, Billy Moon. Now, like Brianne and Colin to come forward. So I have some things I think I should say. One thing is that he taught me everything I know about sports, and if it weren't for him, I would not be as good as I am at sports. <coughs> he describes himself as being cool, being awesome, and the smartest in the world. My sister says he's not. I say he is. I'm going with your groups with me. <laughs> I'm really sad to see him go, one thing is that he says his favorite job is a fireman, but it really is being a dad. I say that I'm the favorite, but I only say that. He inspired me to be a fireman, well, want to be a fireman. He made me want to join juniors. I might be the new nozzle man, which he was really proud of. I will never forget how he taught me how to roller skate. My name is Colin Moon, and I love him so much.
I'm going to speak on behalf of Brienne. My dad, William, used to drive me nuts. He would make me laugh and cry at the same time. He thought he was the smartest ever. I never agreed. He always talked about how he destroyed someone after work. My dad was there, my dad was there every second he could, but I'll tell you, wherever he was, he knew someone. He always tried to, he always said common sense, 100%, and try. He made me the soccer player I am today. If you know my dad well, this will make sense. If you were driving down Webster, he would be like a bad fire right there and a couple blocks over, a bad car accident. And did I ever tell you the house next door went up in flames? As you see, he remembers every fire he's ever been to, but he can't remember my teacher's name, and it's not a hard name. We will miss you sometimes annoying, William Moon. We love you. I think you'll notice a theme as we've all been talking, and I'm not quite sure how to follow that up, but I'll give it a try. But first, I have to say how proud I am of Brianne and Colin. You may be surprised to know she wants to be a teacher one day. I have no idea where she gets it from. And as for Colin, Chief Hodgins and Commissioner Kavanaugh, I, have a, I hope the department is ready. I'm fairly certain he will rise through the ranks of the FDNY one day. We have heard a lot about Billy, his dedication to his career, friends, family and now others through his wishes to be an organ donor. Billy was a strong personality and many often said his reputation preceded him. Many times we would all joke and everyone would ask, how did you marry this guy? So as I stand here today, I'm going to tell you why. We met through friends back in 2001. We quickly became friends ourselves, talking, texting, and closing the bars at 4 a.m. We gave each other advice about life and love. And one thing I think we both always admire about the other is that we didn't sugarcoat that advice and always kept things open and honest. Fast forward nine years, we finally realized there's something more. Start dating, buy a house, and those 4 a.m. nights, bar nights, quickly became 4 a.m. feedings. Our wedding was big, and Billy's only request that it be a great party. And in Billy's words, it was a classic. When Brienne was born, he was so happy to know that he had a girl who would come back to take care of him. She had him wrapped around her finger from day one, and I was quickly pushed out of the picture. When we found out Colin was a boy, he secretly went upstairs, did a dance and celebration to himself, because he immediately thought about all of the things he could teach his son, and that he did. From sports to fire department racing and firefighting, they talked about it all. If you were to peel back the layers of Billy from fireman to son, just the simple fact that Brianne and Colin want to tell you about him, whether they made it to this podium or not, speaks volumes to the type of father he was. I'd stress about the schedules, and he'd always assure me that it would work out. And it did. He bought the clothes to cheer on their teams and took as many videos as he could. He would joke about orchestra and chorus not being his thing, but his schedule magically worked out for each concert. The nine years Billy and I spent together as friends tells you we both knew what we were getting into. From our own stubbornness to our own passions, we respected each other, cheered for one another, and always confided in one another. It was a balance where we could tell the other when they were being a little much, but at the same time be the shoulder to cry on. Brienne even said recently, how can you argue and five minutes later be besties again? <laughs> Billy said, I love you first long before we had a relationship. He always knew, even before me, that there was an us. When we started dating, he told me once, I'm more of a high five versus an I love you in public kind of guy. From that point forward, many texts ended in age five, or if we were out with friends, a subtle high five to one another was just our way of saying, I see you and I love you. I could go on, but as you can see that, as tough a fireman he was, I knew his quirks. I knew that when he was relaxing, he would massage his temples and close his eyes, or if he was thinking, twirl his hair and leave a piece sticking out of the side of his head. And now don't get me wrong, he snored, chewed like a cow, shoveled food in his mouth, and he was never on time or always cut it close. 
He referred to it as Billy Moon timing. He repeated stories regular to the point that I think they always added an extra detail just so I couldn't tell him that I've already heard it. For example, when Billy ordered 20 chicken nuggets, it was because he wanted to eat 20 chicken nuggets. He believed in logic and common sense, and if he was passionate about something, he was 100% on board. It was Billy who always was the one to make sure we had family game nights, even if that meant we taught them how to play craps during quarantine. There were dance parties in the living room, Nerf wars inside the house, and rolling of the eyes from a young girl. But he always, always knew how to make both the kids and I laugh, even when we didn't want to. Some may have already heard me say recently that marrying Billy was like a marriage to the firehouse. His dedication and love for the job was intertwined into our daily lives. I have videos of the kids responding to their own calls. He wasn't allowed to leave the house without telling them what he had. When he was chief, he kept toys in his desk drawer so the kids could be entertained while they were there. He took great pride in serving Islip as chief, following in the footsteps of his dad, who was once chief of the Islip Terrace Fire Department nearby. The days and nights we were able to talk to him, their first question was always, how many runs did you have and what was it? There were always pictures taken in front of the different rigs and tours of the firehouses, including talks about how sheets do not need to be folded. <laughs> and I always understood that what was said at the kitchen table was the gospel. I'm sorry. He started his career in 133 and said to me he would have no problems retiring there. And if he didn't go to rescue, he loved that house. He worked hard, he kept up his desire, and got that spot in rescue too. He was so proud of himself, and we were proud of him. He never stopped reaching for the stars, and if you asked him, according to Billy, he never worked a day in his life. For Billy, it was never about making himself better, but about what, he can, what can be done to better serve those around him. The fire department is a family, and I'm internally grateful for that family and our own. I recently told the kids to watch what they do as they grow up. They now have several hundred new aunts and uncles watching over them. People talk about strength, but I think we are as strong as the community is holding us, and luckily ours have been holding us high, so thank you. Many have often heard me say I am raising the female version of Billy and Brienne and the mini-me version of In Colin. Therefore, I know his big personality and strong sense of passion in life will live on as they grow and carry his legacy. Billy, you're my best friend. You will be our forever hero. We love you 100 percent. At this moment, we would ask the members of the company to reassemble uh, outside of the church.
May I ask the rest of the congregation to please stand? Trusting in God, we have prayed together today for, for Billy, and now we come to our farewell. And it's never easy to be parted from the people that we love, but we're also people of faith. And so we know and trust that one day we'll see him again and enjoy his friendship and love for all eternity. So until that day of reunion comes for any one of us, let us always comfort and console one another in the peace and promise of Christ's resurrection. May the choirs of angels come to greet you. May they speak you to paradise. May the Lord enfold you in his mercy. May you find it into the embrace of your love, Father. We now gently place the soul of Billy, our brother, in that sure and certain hope that together with those who die in Christ, Billy too will rise with him on the last day. Today we thank you for the blessings you gave him in this life, for the love of family and friends, for the countless people who have cherished him and cared for him, those who love him and will now miss him. Each one of them were assigned to Billy of your goodness and his fellowship among the saints in Christ. O merciful Lord, we ask that you turn toward us, that you hear our prayer, that you open the gates of paradise to your servant, to Billy, your faithful son, and help all of us who remain here to be of comfort to one another. Until that day finally dawns, when we will all meet in Christ, and we'll be with you and with Billy for all eternity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In peace now, we take our brother to his place of rest.
Ready? Two.
You've been watching the funeral for FDNY firefighter William Moon, who died last week after a tragic training accident. Moon's family says even in his death, he is still fulfilling his oath to give his life for others by donating his organs to those in need. We'll have more on the emotional goodbye to one of New York's bravest here on CBS News New York and on CBS News at 5 and 6. We'll be right back.